Hey, so if you're even a little bit familiar with online politics, you've probably already overdosed on references to Weimar and Nazi Germany. People comparing their political opponents to Nazis, people making World War II analogies for contemporary foreign policy, people trying to push their preferred set of policies because if we don't act soon, it'll be just like the rise of the Third Reich all over again. And because it's the internet, a lot of these invocations are notoriously ahistorical, dishonest, or just downright comical. But there are some comparisons that do have some value. Today, there seems to be no shortage of people comparing present-day America to interwar Germany, and there is some truth in that. For example, the lingering nostalgia that people in red states have for the Confederacy does kind of resemble the cult of memory for Bismarck's German Empire that the Nazis eagerly appealed to whenever they could. A couple of years ago, I sort of tongue-in-cheek described the January 6th riots as the QAnon beer hall putsch, which I'll happily stand by. I don't think it's too hyperbolic to say that a sizable portion of Republican voters would happily accept the label of fascism if it weren't for all the historical baggage that the term carries. However, I think comparisons like this can often lead people to miss the forest for the trees. When we compare the Weimar Republic to the present day, the temptation is always to hone in on the similarities because those parts are the most captivating. It's easy to look at some event in the news and say, aha, this is just like what happened in Weimar Germany. Now adopt my positions or else you'll be paving the way for fascism like all the other liberals did or whatever the f Focusing on the similarities is natural, but in my opinion, it can also force a certain perspective by drawing attention away from all the things that made Weimar Germany different from contemporary society. And at least for the liberal democracies of today, I would argue that the differences far outweigh the similarities. And today, I want to look at one example of a debate where both sides seem to be guilty of making this mistake in their own way. This is a free speech and censorship debate known as the Weimar fallacy. Now, whether we're looking at history or current events, it's always good to be mindful of how people might embed their political opinions into their work. For a topic like this, where we have so much available information, it can be difficult to put different perspectives into context. That's why I like using Ground News. The Ground News website and app is a great tool for navigating through thousands of articles from different sources around the world. Every story is supplemented with a visual breakdown of all the different outlets covering it, with information about their political biases, how factual the source is, and who the source is owned by. This is especially helpful if you're one of those free thinker types who wants to challenge your own preconceptions and avoid being stuck in one of those dreaded echo chambers they're always talking about. When I looked up censorship, for example, I was given a selection of 182 stories on that topic in the last three months, and I also learned that stories on censorship are predominantly covered by the right wing. For this video, I was able to narrow down my search for this specific topic, which led me to this opinion piece on censorship in Weimar Germany. As you'll see later in the video, the assessment that it leans right and was rated for mixed factuality is pretty accurate. So what you should do is go to ground.news slash lonerbox or follow the link in the description and try using ground news for yourself. Part 1. The Weimar Fallacy if you've ever watched the likes of Michael Moore or listened to various other left-wing populists, you might have come away with an impression of Weimar Germany as this flourishing liberal democracy, maybe even the most progressive in Europe. If you wanted to present this image, you could point to the rich culture of jazz and cabaret in Berlin, the atonal music of Arnold Schoenberg, expressionist cinema, the magic realism of artists who would later have their work displayed for mockery by the Nazis in an exhibition called Degenerate Art. You could mention the sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld, who secured government funding from the Social Democrats to create an institution for sexual science which promoted LGBT rights and successfully campaigned to relax abortion laws. Even their voting system in the Reichstag was proportionately representative. If you could win 10% of the votes, you'd get 10% of the seats. Then you might have also run into people who invoke this image to make the argument that the rise of the Nazis was an example of democracy run amok. 
how liberal values of free speech combined with a pluralistic voting system produced the perfect environment for ill-intentioned actors to spread their hateful authoritarian ideology without interruption. Then, once they had won over the public, they would immediately rein in the freedoms and civil liberties that they had used to gain that power in the first place. In West Germany at one point, this rationale was used to promote the idea of a militant democracy, where prohibition of hate speech and anti-democratic sentiment is necessary to preserve democracy so that pluralism can't be abused as a path to dictatorship. As the saying went, there would be no liberty for the enemies of liberty. Or, as the political scientist Marcus Thiel put it, even the most modern concept of democracy cannot forego institutions to protect the state from enemies of the constitution. Democracy has therefore adopted limits and does not permit that its own protections be abused for purposes of eliminating it. That implicit self-limitation forms a genuine component of any modern understanding of democracy. When he says enemies here, he does mean enemies in word rather than enemies in action. And obviously the threshold for what constitutes a criminal enemy of the constitution based on speech is going to be far more subjective than someone who, say, leads an armed insurrection against the government, but we'll touch on that a bit later. Essentially, the argument here is that speech laws should stretch beyond what we might call fighting words, for example, incitements to violence and concrete threats, to also include more general expressions of hatred or anti-democratic sentiment. This is quite an important distinction because even the most ardent free speech supporters tend to be okay with banning the former, whereas legal bans on hateful sentiment are far more contentious. When people do advocate for laws against the latter, they often do so with an appeal to interwar Germany. In short, had the state been more vigilant against hateful rhetoric, they might have been able to stop the Nazis before they came to power. Now, there are quite a few critiques you could make of this idea. The main one I want to talk about comes from the legal scholar Eric Heinz, who describes this appeal to what happened in Germany as the Weimar fallacy. According to Heinz, the Weimar fallacy is the idea that the snowballing of hatred in some democracies proves the vulnerability of democracies as such. As a staunch supporter of free speech, Heinz argues that the appeal to interwar Germany as a justification for hate speech bans in contemporary liberal democracies is a false equivalence. Countries like Canada, France, the UK and the US are what Heinz calls long-standing, stable and prosperous democracies. The Weimar Republic, on the other hand, was not long-standing or stable. You could argue it was somewhat prosperous, aside from the whole hyperinflation and Great Depression thing, and at least in its final couple of years, it was only really a democracy in name. The point is, while there might have been a good reason to clamp down on anti-democratic sentiment in Weimar Germany, this isn't something that necessarily applies to the more stable and long-standing democracies of today. As Heinz also points out, the Weimar Republic was far from being the pinnacle of liberal democracy that some people make it out to be. The one aspect he points to here is the people. The Weimar Republic emerged from a disastrous military defeat and it was notably unwelcome among the German people. Concepts of pluralism, debate, and civil dissent were a novelty amongst a population that had been brought up in a world of hierarchy, prejudice, and obedience. From 1920 onwards, the parties that supported the Republic never won more than 50% of the votes. It was famously a democracy without Democrats. And in this environment, broad conspiracy theories about the Jews, denouncements of democratic norms, values, and institutions will have held much more weight than they could have in a long-standing democracy. For a comparison, in 1928, the Nazis still only had 2.6% of the vote. But by this time, the impact of their message had already culminated in an attempted coup and widespread street violence across the country. Only two years after this election, they would become the second largest party in the Reichstag. Contrast this with a group like the openly fascist British National Party. In 2010, they won just under 2% of the vote, and this culminated in, well, basically nothing. A few scuffles on the campaign trail, and a disastrous appearance on BBC Question Time before the party completely collapsed. So, that's Heinz's argument. 
The idea of a militant democracy might have been justified in a fledgling republic like interwar Germany, but this can't be extrapolated to a more stable and long-standing democracy like the ones we have today in Europe and North America. Now, I disagree with him a little bit here, but we'll come back to that. For now, we can say that his position at least has the benefit of being historically honest, which is more than can be said for this next bunch. Heinz coined the term Weimar fallacy in a book he wrote in 2016, but the concept has since found its way, unfortunately, into the hands of libertarians and free speech absolutists. And here the argument gets a bit more shaky. Their version of the Weimar fallacy states that there actually were strong measures taken against hate speech in Germany. The problem was that they either didn't work, or that they actually worked to the Nazis' advantage. So, let's see how that goes. Part 2. The Libertarian Argument The people who argue this case usually point to Article 118 of the Weimar Constitution, which stated, no censorship shall be established, but still allowed for censorship of cinema, indecent and obscene literature, public plays and exhibitions. Crucially, it also allowed for the suspension of fundamental rights, including freedom of speech, if public safety could be disturbed or threatened. The meaning of public safety was broadened even more by the 1922 law for the defense of the Republic, which allowed the authorities to suppress newspapers expressing contempt for the state, the flag, members of government, and advocacy of violence. Now, Weimar Germany had a lot of political parties and a federalized system, which meant a lot of newspapers. The country had more daily newspapers than Britain, France, and Italy combined. And given that the Nazis were banned from radio broadcasting until 1933, papers were crucial to their campaigning. And contrary to what advocates for militant democracy might have argued, the Nazis did encounter a fair bit of censorship. After the Beer Hall Putsch, Hitler was banned from speaking in most of Germany until 1927. Between 1930 and 32, 284 papers were banned and the majority of them were run by Nazis and other far-right groups. In the space of five months in 1932, even under the ultra-conservative Chancellor Franz von Papen, 95 papers were banned, most of them from the Communist and Nazi parties. Two of the most notorious examples of hateful propaganda outlets were the papers Der Stürmer and Der Angriff. Der Stürmer was an unofficial weekly paper known for its viciously anti-Semitic caricatures, accusations of blood libel, and flat-out calls for violence against the Jewish community. Up to and during the war, they frequently published articles calling for the extermination of the Jewish race. The Jewish groups that took the paper to court didn't always succeed, but they did have a few victories, one of which resulted in the paper's owner, Julius Streicher, spending two months in jail. From 1923 to 33, the paper was either confiscated or taken to court 36 times. In 1928, the staff were subjected to five litigations in just 11 days. Even Goebbels was dragged to court several times by the Jewish vice president of the Berlin police for libelous claims he had printed in Der Angriff and was even occasionally forced to pay fines. Whatever it was that could have stopped the Nazis, it doesn't look like newspaper bans and keeping them away from radio broadcasting helped. So that's the argument and as far as I can tell, the factual claims given here are correct. But there are a few problems with the way this story is told. Mainly, every proponent of this argument seems to use the terms hate speech, libel, and incitement to violence almost interchangeably. It's hard to tell whether these penalties on Nazi papers were the result of some hyper-aggressive defense of minority rights, or just regular old cases that would have been legally actionable pretty much anywhere. So when the author from this often libertarian website says that in the space of two years, 99 Nazi newspapers were banned in Prussia alone, I have no idea what proportion of these bans were for hate speech. But if these papers were being banned for incitement to violence, concrete threats, or defamation, well, even our First Amendment free speech cowboys in the United States have laws for those things. Even going by a lot of these authors, it seems that the excesses of Weimar censorship didn't have so much to do with minority protections as they were the punitive actions of governments trying to muzzle their critics. 
Under Papen, papers were banned for printing cartoons that mocked his leadership, and others were banned for criticizing his decision to lift a ban on the brown shirts. The very reasonable critique here is that laws like this, along with the infamous Article 48, proved deadly in the hands of the Nazis the moment they could get their hands on them. But my real problem with the free speech absolutist argument is where they go next. Part 3. Libertarian Batshittery For some proponents of the Weimar fallacy argument, the idea that censorship simply didn't help isn't good enough. Instead, they try to push the envelope a little further and argue that censorship actually helped the Nazis. Basically, the idea here is that otherwise well-meaning liberal Germans saw the flurry of press bans and prosecutions against the Nazis and were appalled to see such a flagrant disregard for the values of free speech and open debate that they couldn't help but sympathize with their fellow citizens. They might have disagreed with constant accusations of blood libel in the press, but they were damned if people didn't have a right to print them. One proponent of this idea is the Danish journalist Fleming Rose. In a book called The Tyranny of Silence, he identifies certain laws such as one against insulting communities of faith which carried up to three years imprisonment. He goes on to make a kind of shaky argument about how the Jewish groups that sued Nazi newspapers were actually weaponized by propagandists who presented the lawsuits as proof of a Jewish conspiracy against patriotic Germans. Now, they did kind of do that, but the people being sued were pushing those conspiracy theories anyway, so I'm not sure how that would have changed anything. I don't know if he's suggesting that the Jewish groups should have just turned the other cheek on defamatory claims, but who knows. But what really bothers me about this book is this paragraph where he argues, the widely made claim that hate speech against the Jews was a primary factor of the Holocaust has no empirical support. Okay. In fact, one might forcefully argue that what paved the way for the Holocaust was the ban on hate speech, insofar as it handed Stryker and other Nazis a glorious opportunity to bait the Jewish community in the German courtrooms and in the national press, which otherwise would have spared them precious little ink. For the Democrats of the Weimar Republic, a far more effective strategy would have been to address Nazi propaganda in free and open public debate. But in Europe between the wars, confidence in free speech was running low. Now, as much as I enjoy addressing Nazi propaganda in free and open public debate, this is one of the stupidest paragraphs I've ever read on the internet. It's never enough to say that hate speech bans don't work, something which you could make a convincing case for. It has to be that speech bans made the Nazis stronger. Anyone who wanted to counter this claim would just have to point to the timeline, which shows you how the Nazis were faring when Hitler was banned from public speaking, compared to how they did after the ban was lifted. He also gives no justification for the idea that the press would have spared the Nazis precious little ink had they only not been sued by Jewish groups. It's possible he just made that part up, because again, the timeline is not on his side given that anti-Semitism wasn't even a priority in Nazi messaging when they started gaining votes. The other thing Rose is guilty of here is a classic example of presentism. That is, he's interpreting the attitudes of people in Weimar Germany through the lens of contemporary values implying that Nazis were able to use their censorship to cynically appeal to liberal values of free speech a take which is usually accompanied by this poster of Hitler with tape over his mouth complaining about being censored. Of course, this is a tactic that contemporary fascists use all the time, but that's because they live in a world where free speech is a deeply ingrained value. Applying this to the Weimar Republic, however, is ludicrous. People in Weimar Germany didn't give a fuck about free speech, and the ones who did certainly weren't going to vote for the Nazis. Because unlike contemporary fascists, the Nazis made no effort to disguise their views on free expression. As early as 1920, Hitler was openly saying things like, it must be forbidden to publish papers which do not promote the national welfare. We demand legal prosecution of all tendencies in art and literature of a kind likely to disintegrate our life as a nation. Even among the German intellectuals and middle classes of the time, their motivations for defecting to the Nazi party were generally things like nostalgia for Bismarck's German Empire, 
authoritarian rule as a comforting alternative to the chaos in the Reichstag, the fear of communism, the longing for a sense of national pride after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, eugenics, anti-Semitism. Even the middle-class feminists of the time were more often proponents of family values and sexual self-restraint. In short, the people who voted for the Nazis cared about a lot of things, but free speech was never one of them. But all the same, this is an assertion that proponents of the Weimar fallacy argument can't seem to help but throw in. Take this article, which correctly states that anti-hate speech laws didn't stop Hitler coming to power, but then has to add that, on the contrary, if anything, they helped the Nazis gain legitimacy among a substantial section of the German public. Of course, he doesn't say anything to support that claim, and the book he's talking about doesn't either. It doesn't even really make sense, because Nazis were never the only ones being censored. Communist papers were banned all over the country, as were some social democrat and liberal ones. If anyone was turning to the Nazis out of sympathy for deplatforming, they would have also had some predisposition that stopped them from defecting to any of the other censored parties. If you look at this set of data from one of the elections, most of the new Nazi votes came from first-time voters or from parties that were already right-wing. 1920s right-wing, which means they definitely had no love for free speech or even democracy in the first place. This is a very good example of people conveniently focusing on only a few trees and then using their biases to fill in the blanks about what the rest of the forest looks like. And the worst thing is, the stretches they're making aren't even necessary. If you wanted to make an argument that hate speech laws wouldn't have stopped the Nazis, a more honest libertarian could have just said something like this. In the period between 1928 and 1930, where the Nazi party finally increased their vote share beyond the single figures, it's hard to see how hate speech laws would have helped all that much. This is because anti-Semitism, which was essential to the party from the very beginning, actually took a backseat in their propaganda just as they really started to grow. Now, obviously this had nothing to do with a change in perspective. They did this because an opportunity had opened for them to pull right-wing voters over from other parties. In 1929, the Great Depression threw millions of people out of work, and the people they were most likely to flock to was the Communist Party. The growth of the Communist Party, with their violent rhetoric and promises to usher in a Soviet Germany, caused the middle classes to, um, shite themselves. They knew full well what happened to people like them in Russia after 1918, and they quickly abandoned the failing conventional right-wing parties to rally around the Nazis instead. These voters will have been anti-Semitic enough themselves, but it was not their priority. The Nazis knew this and altered their message accordingly. As the historian Richard Evans put it, the Nazis were a catch-all party of social protest with particularly strong middle-class support and relatively weak, though still very significant, working-class backing at the polls. They had broken out of their core constituency of the Protestant lower middle classes and farming community. The hated, calamitous Weimar Republic had to be got rid of, and the people united once more in a national community that knew no parties or classes, just as it had been in 1914. Germany had to reassert itself on the international scene and become a leading power again. That was more or less what the Nazis' program amounted to. They modified their specific policies according to their audience, playing down their anti-Semitism where it met with no response, for example, which is to say, in most parts of the electorate after 1928. In other words, they managed to make their big break with the German voters at exactly the same time when hate speech laws would have been the least effective against them. But at this point, you might be wondering, okay, Lonerbox, so you aren't sold on the idea that hate speech laws would have helped, but you also think the objections to it are mired with a bunch of ahistorical libertarian bullshit. But what's your position? How would you have stopped the Nazis, Lonerbox? Well, I don't know. Yes, I tend to lean mostly towards the free speech side. As Rosa Luxemburg said in her pamphlet on the Russian Revolution, Freedom only for the supporters of the government, only for the members of the party, however numerous they may be, is no freedom at all. Freedom is always and exclusively freedom for the one 
who thinks differently. Yes, strongly agree. But I do also think the Jewish groups who sued Nazis for defamation and incitement were perfectly in the right to do so. I am not an absolutist, but when people talk about banning more vague things like obscenity, hateful rhetoric, anti-democratic sentiment, I'm a bit less sympathetic. As I mentioned earlier, the problem with a lot of advocates for militant democracy is that they rarely make any distinction between words and actions. I think this approach is way too blurry, especially when, in my opinion, it doesn't really need to be. If you wanted to find some legal avenue to shut down the Nazis, you could have tried a kind of nip-it-in-the-bud approach to hateful or anti-democratic ideologies, but that would have been very broad. If we were banning anti-democratic sentiment, even the Communist Party would have had to go. And (laughs) we definitely don't want that. For me, I think one of the big problems with the Weimar Republic was their failure to address hateful and anti-democratic actions more so than speech. After all, the Nazis were not just a group of politicians with wacky ideas. They were gangsters who acted with flagrant disregard for the law right from the beginning. They would put red flags outside of their meetings in order to get leftists through the door and then beat the shit out of them when they arrived. Any reasonable legal system wouldn't have even needed hate speech laws to suppress them. And the best example of the Weimar Republic failing on this count, in my opinion, is the court's response to the Beer Hall Putsch. Part 4. Clemenza. In November 1923, when the Nazi party was little more than a small group of violent political agitators, mostly concentrated in Bavaria, they made their first attempt at seizing power. Their plan was to arrest the Bavarian government and force them to join the Nazis in their attempt to overthrow the national government in Berlin. The coup was inspired by Mussolini's successful march on Rome, which took place a year earlier, but their plan was flawed from the beginning. They had failed to win the support of the army and other key conservative forces in Bavaria, and the coup was quickly halted in a shooting exchange with the police. 20 people were killed and Hitler was arrested for treason. Bear in mind that this was the 1920s and Hitler had just tried to overthrow the government. By the standards of the time, he would have been executed, or at the very least thrown in jail for the rest of his life, along with Himmler, Goering, and all the other leading figures present. But this was Weimar Germany, where the right-wing sympathies of the judiciary would put any current American Supreme Court justice to shame. The Beer Hall Putsch ended up giving Hitler his first dose of front-page national media exposure, and the 24-day trial that followed basically amounted to a free PR campaign. The nationalist judges suppressed evidence in order to acquit General Ludendorff, who was one of Hitler's accomplices. The state prosecutor failed to call in several key witnesses. For the ones who were called, Hitler was given free reign to bulldoze them on the stand without interruption. Knowing his words would be reported in the press, he essentially turned the courtroom into a soapbox where the judges sat back as he gave his message to the nation. His opening statement was nearly four hours long, and with no hint of apology for his crimes. Instead, he argued, the eternal court of history will judge us as Germans who wanted the best for their people and their fatherland. His words were incidentally not too different from those of the presiding judge, who ruled that although the putsch had clearly broken the law, the participants nonetheless were led in their action by a pure patriotic spirit and the most noble will. The plea to deport Hitler from Austria was rejected. He was sentenced to five years in jail, only to be released in just under nine months. For a crime like this, any reasonable democratic system would have ensured that Hitler and his accomplices could never run for office again. As always, it comes back to what Clemenza said in that scene in The Godfather. You know, you gotta stop him at the beginning. Like, they should have stopped Hitler at Munich. They should never let him get away with that. They was just asking for big trouble. After the trial, Hitler's party was outlawed for just under two years, and he was banned from public speaking in most of Germany until 1927. And after that, it was back to business as usual. It was just the icing for big trouble. It's hard to exaggerate just how shameless the German courts were in their right-wing sympathies. Between 1919 and 1922, a statistician recorded 22 left-wing and 354 right-wing murders over the three-year period. 
the 22 left-wing murders resulted in 38 convictions, 10 of which were executions. The right-wing murders, by contrast, only resulted in 24 convictions, none of which were executions, and, most glaringly, 23 of the murderers who confessed were acquitted. How could that happen? Well, because in Weimar Germany, it was perfectly normal for judges to let right-wing murderers off the hook if they could prove that their crimes were motivated by patriotism. Yeah, so if we're talking about the Weimar fallacy, which side of the argument does this fall on? Does it support the idea of a highly liberalized society with pluralism and free speech run amok? Or does it lend weight to the idea of fascists being aggressively clamped down upon by the state? The answer is neither. I guess the moral of this story is, be wary of people making Weimar Germany comparisons on the internet. Fact check this video, and I encourage you to ram me in the comment section if you think I got anything wrong. And if you <laughs> want to support my content, you can follow me on Patreon, where I upload exclusive segments and Q&A sections every month. Bye.